first will consist of one poem. It's about Grace King, on whom I shall speak tomorrow afternoon at 4 o'clock in a scholarly paper. Uh, and I, I do like to treat, this is not the first time I've treated a, a, a topic, an author, and maybe one particular angle, in both prose and poetry. In one case with a California author, I've got on her a book chapter, an article, and a two-page poem. So I like to look at the thing under different, different ways. And then the second section will be uh, a, f a few little uh, timely uh, political poems, timely, suitable to our general interest here. And the third will consist of some Abbeville favorites. Some of you have heard some of two or three of them before, and I thought it'd be nice for the others to get them too. So let me tell you that the title of this is Grace King on the Bayous, 1862. She was born in 1852, died in 1932, so she was 10. Actually, she was just short of 10 years old uh, in 1862, that year. In, and you know she's from New Orleans. Uh, and uh, her father had to leave because he was a marked man, and the family also fled. And the poem is about the fleeing. Uh, in the poem, I, I refer to someone, some poor connection, that means formerly poor, now of high estate. That is a, uh, a, a roundabout way to say a collaborator, as the French called him while the Germans were in Paris, in France. Someone who has sold out her neighbors or, or uh, family members and has been richly rewarded by Butler and so on. So that's what that is. Then I do refer to Beast Butler. He was also known, you know, as Spoons, as somebody said yesterday, because he did like the family silver. And a butcher, but the, the kings called him the ogre. Uh, then I want to say that in the fourth stanza, uh, there's a mention of an old rag doll. It will reappear and a mention of a flower barrel, and it also will be mentioned again. Uh, then, as they flee, they go to the bayou country. They have to, I mean, one has to do this. They, they have to use a Mississippi River, go upriver for a while, then overland, and then into the bayou country. So you've got sort of a three-part journey there. Uh, and... Uh, I believe, oh, and then there's a, a, a reference to le bayou plaquemine. Plaquemine means persimmon. And there's, a, there's Plaquemine's Parish downriver, and there's the bayou plaquemine, and there's a plaquemine, uh, uh, the, the word appears here and there. And I use the French for it because it, it fit the meter and also for the flavoring. So this is an iambic pentameter, unrhymed, a good a good meter for a narrative poem. Grace King on the Bayous, 1862. Not yet 10 years of age, already wise, however, in the ways of war, she fled New Orleans with her family to escape the Federals. Her father, warned in time, he would not take the Union oath, had quit his office casually but half disguised, and headed west toward New Iberia, behind the lines where he owned land. He sent brief word that they should join him there. The house was seized that very day, their goods destroyed or carried to the street for plundering. The world had given way. To leave was quite forbidden, though, some poor connection, now of high estate, procured for them a pass, but it must have a counter signature. All wit, composure, purpose, Mrs. King went out to face Beast Butler in his lair. To no avail, he was not moved. By chance, another general outside the door had heard and signed. She found a steamboat, Grace could not say how, to take them, mother, babe, in arms, the Presbyterian grandmama, 
the children, Negroes, up the river. Not the ark, but safety. As they said goodbye beneath the fragrant jasmine, neighbors thrust at Grace an old rag doll. Quite artless. First, a levee landing by the stubbled cane. A deckhand rolled a flower barrel down the plank. Not mine, said Mrs. King. Hush, hush, the captain warned. I'm a Confederate. At two plantations, there was help. A cart conveyed them farther on. They slept in comfort once. A ferry was half burnt, yet they engaged the dubious owner, reached Le Bayou Plaquemine, went on by barge along another, heartened then two lakes by skiff. A sandbar pinioned them. Night fell. In silence, Grandmama appealed to God. How many days had passed? How many ways had Providence assisted them? Her faith was firm. Marooned for hours, each one hallowed. Sorry, that's hallooed. Beg your pardon. Again, by chance, the father, resting at an inn, not far, miraculously, overheard a band of soldiers dressed in gray relate how they had stopped a woman on a lake surrounded by her family, questioned her. It must have been his wife. Such charm, her way of speaking, and the girl, how droll. He cut on horseback through a swamp, got help, then rode beside the shore and commandeered a boat and men to go ahead with lights. At last, faint shouts, a choking voice replying, sounds of oarlocks grating, blessed deliverance. Such cries, such gratitude, and even more. Concealed deep in the flower were medicines addressed to troops nearby. The ragged doll, it seems undone, revealed a wad of bills. Unconscious contraband. The bondsmen freed remained throughout the war, and most returned with them. Grace never would forget. For what the whirlwind left in the debris was love, resolve, new sympathies, and her great gift, a girl's, a woman's words, as witnesses, the shiny coins of patience and the mind. You'll find out more about, oh, thank you. No need, no need to clap. You'll find out more about her tomorrow, this is. All right, the next is a series of nine poems of five lines each under the general title of Monuments. I want to talk about this. This is political satire. Now, poetry and satire, or I should say poetry and politics, are really not very good bedfellows most of the time. But if you do it in a satiric mode, you can do it. Uh, Swift did it, Dryden did it, Pope did it. Uh, so it can work. Now, these will be published in a, a book that Shotwell will bring out before too many months here to be called Chained Tree, Chained Owls. And the cover is an original painting, not by me. It consists of about 50 poems by my co-author, D.C. Berry of Mississippi, whom I've never met, but have corresponded with, obviously, and about 50 poems by me, all it, it, that is theoretically in the same form. He's loosey-goosey, and I'm not. <laughs> but they're all five-line poems. His have little uh, added words to them. Uh, this uh, form is not my invention. Uh, it's used by some of the 17th century British poets, including Edmund Waller, uh, with a different rhyme scheme, but the the uh, but I have 
devised a word known to in English but not used for this before called quintain on the on the model of a quatrain. So these are quintains. They are an iambic pentameter rhymed A B A B A. Um, I should say uh, about the iambic pentameter, it is both the handmaiden and the queen of English poetry. It's, it's beautiful for itself, but it does what you need it to do also, as a handmaiden would. Okay, prologue. The New People's Republic has launched its campaign, much like Stalin and Hitler, like Mao, Pol Pot, to remove all that's harmful, to launder my brain, tear down statues, change language, impose tummy rot. We must wipe out the past and repent. It's insane. On Lee Circle, New Orleans, you know that the mayor at the time was one Mitch Landrieu, Landrieu, they pronounce it Landrieu. A foul fait accompli, an altered view. As usual, fanatics are to blame, and egos gratified by much ado. But Lee, at least, will always be a name. We cannot say the same of you, Landrew. <laughs> now the next one is called At the Entrance to City Park, and there was a statue there, was, uh, of someone who was mentioned earlier today, General Beauregard at the entrance to City Park. They couldn't stop with R.E. Lee, of course. The cleansing must be thorough, the more to hurt us. Beauregard is gone thus, so's his horse. But why just monuments, mere stone inert? We may be next, pure evil at its source. site of the Jefferson Davis Memorial Canal Street. There's not much left. The pedestal and base, the man himself are gone, removed at night by take em down, which didn't dare to face the public. Yankees always had it right, so like today's who feast on our disgrace. interlude at the Supreme Court. Now this is, has only indirect connection to the monument matter, and it refers uh, more to a Supreme Court of, of some months before last summer, but anyway, you'll understand. With law, life, marriage redefined, what's next? Free drugs, polygamy, child sacrifice? The country's overdosed and oversexed and crawls with illegality and lice. Oh, courts supreme, unreason's meta-text. <laughs> we got a more, we're gonna move to other states here. St. Louis. Two statues, undisturbed, stood in a park. <laughs> Both honored officers, the South, the North. The vandals pulled one down. That is a mark of tyranny. Don't speak of peace henceforth. A winch still dangles somewhere in the dark. <laughs> Charlottesville, is Professor Wilson here? Yes. This is in quotation marks because it's someone else other than the poet's voice speaking. It's all the fault of Mr. Jefferson, who built his university for men, white men. Now revolution has begun. One statue's gone. It's time to move again. Let's burn the library. Call out the Hun. <laughs> Christ Church, Alexandria. George Washington's own parish where he prayed, enthralled to fashion now, removes a plaque 
then too, to please the whiners. What his shade may think, I wonder. Quite the proper tack for us is, show the stuff of what we're made. Epilogue. And I mentioned in the last line, Cleo, you know, the muse of history. This childish rage defies both circumstance and sense. Distractions, so Confucius saith. Look first to your own measures in the dance of time and leave alone men of good faith and patriots. Let Cleo have a chance. That's the end of that series. So I have three uh, a poem. Uh, these, these are all brand new from, uh, well, a, a recent, very recent months, including a, a very, very recent months. But these are former poems, all been published in some of my collections. And I'm not sure that I have read here before the first one, perhaps so. Uh, it's set in uh, Iberville Parish in Louisiana. We got Louisianans here with us. Live Oak House. <laughs> and this mentions uh, Andrew Jackson and somebody named Dickinson who, who dueled with Jackson. The ancestry though not Virginian, still was good. The men of upright character as well as property, the women strong and known for beauty, but of iron will, believing all in stewardship of land, a decent treatment for the Negroes, law. But Dickinson and Andrew Jackson dueled in 1825, and Jackson killed his adversary. Later, Charles, the son of Dickinson, grown up and married, sold his mansion and estates, left Tennessee, and ventured to the bayous. Would he wish a fortune better than his father's? Yes, to live, not die, with honor. Rowing through the flooded area around Grostet in the Atchafalaya Swamp, he found a clump of oaks above the water line and settled there. He built a cabin first. Imagine the young woman, used to cooks and housemaids and fine furniture, at home among the rough-hewn cypress planks, aroused at dawn by coal and stirring coals to life. Observing morning on its elbows finally lift its face above the treetops. Looking out each evening on the watery wilderness that ties the Mississippi to the west. And yet I think that she did not complain. A woman's pride is to accept her times and husband's fortunes. As she must accept her body, arable desire. Charles drew plans, designed and built the house, Live Oak, its character delineated well. Two stories with an ample dormered roof, all classic lines in pilasters and doors, full shutters, fluting, function tied to grace. His business prospered, timber, planting, trade along the bayous east to Baton Rouge, and Plaquemine, west with the Acadians. Their happiness of great and little joys was glue for others, children, workers, friends. Then that day came that comes for all. She stayed, began a railroad, worked it through the war and after, kept live oak from pillagers, protected fugitives, and cursed the Yankee thieves who swarmed for Lincoln's gain across the South, like locusts. Afterwards, the former slaves remained, since they had lived as freemen, well, by measures of the age. Her years closed round, 
their ending waited as their outlines filled. The house survived her long. A life well thought is texture, ornament, and stable ground. A marbled sea face trimming deeper waves. An architecture of the possible. See how that blossom holds the whole of spring. How birds that score the evening sky can leave intelligible traces in the dark. Think about it. All right, gentlemen who heard hats last year, do you remember hats? Some of you do. This is in free verse. All the others are, are uh, types of am, uh, iambic pentameter. This is in free verse, but it's, but it's very, uh, it has a lot of beat. And I will quote Donald Stanford, the, uh, the, one of the, of the third and fourth editors, that is the team who, star, who, who edited the new Southern Review after it was ended, uh, the one that had been started by Robert Penn Warren and, and Cleanth Brooks. Uh, this is from Donald Stanford who says, without rhythm, poetry is dead. So this has beat, even though it's free verse. It's set in New Orleans. There's no such person, this woman is invented, but she's a, a, a type. Hats, a portrait. She lives alone still in her New Orleans relic of a house on Esplanade, among objets d'art and hats perched in a hall tree. Crazy D, the neighbors say behind her back. Not daft, though, merely out of style. Her ways were fashionable once. Privacy, good taste, proprieties, and lasting love. Along with hats and gloves, high heels and stockings, shopping on Canal Street, Latin mass at the cathedral, bridge, and luncheons. Now, her love, her friends are dead. No children, just a nephew, covetous. The Latin mass was ended by the Vatican. Canal Street is for tourists. And she can't wear high-heeled shoes or pull those awful pantyhose on stiffened limbs. But hats endure, and gloves. In a chest of drawers, she leafs through stacks, long glazed ivory kidskin gloves for balls, fur-lined gloves for winter, pigskin honey-toned for races at the fairgrounds. Cotton summer gloves, all yellowed. Fishnet for a costume ball. Ah, yes, that night. Venetian mask, Elizabethan collar, fur, and waist of 22. A pair of gloves in hand, she walks by little bird steps to a beveled window and the millinery tree. Returning from the honeymoon with Jacques that year, the days when people crossed my ship with boxes, trunks, and portmanteau, she brought from Paris 15 hats. She chooses one, a gray fedora, stylish as a 40 film, 40s film, and tries it, thinking of the honeymoon again. Another in blue straw, with a little turned-up brim and pheasant feathers, uh, angled jauntily. And this a favorite, a darling Hamburg of a luscious black velour, and grow grain trimmed. She'll not go out today, too cool, with impish lake gusts whipping trees and rattling shutters. But there's nothing wrong with make-believe. She dons the Hamburg, adds a bit of veiling found by chance to anchor it against imaginary wind, draws on the gloves, and wraps around her throat an ostrich feather boa from the parlor cabinet. Voila. She checks the mirror, marred like her by age spots, judges the effect. 
A little later, might she even stroll a moment on her gallery? That, sorry, I should have told you. It means veranda or upstairs porch. Stroll a moment on her gallery with oaks and oleanders as the surrogates of friends, a superannuated fashion show, and Jacques' devoted shade returning as in dream. But now the tears have come again. Perhaps she should not try it after all since people stare and meddle, might report her to the nephew. Say she's lost her memory when memory is all she has. The hats hung up, the gloves and boa cast aside. A shaft of slanting light reminds her of a crimson sun at sea, the ship's wake gleaming. Time's a room where dust motes swirl and sparkle in the sun, then disappear. The mansion creaks and lists into the evening. Shivering, she rises, draws the curtains, going down in waves of dark. The last one I've read, this is the third time I've read it to the Abbeville. <laughs> so some of you will remember it. It's called Carolina. It is set in South Carolina in 1875. It's a first person narration, not by a, an, a narrator's voice or poet's voice, but in the voice of the main character, who, as you will hear, uh, 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 was deposited on the coast of South Carolina as a child of five after the revolution in Haiti. And Haiti in, in the poem here is called Saint-Domingue, which is what the French, what it was called in those days, Santo Domingo, the island that now has Haiti on it. Uh, it concerns partly uh, French Huguenots. Didn't someone, people, someone spoke about Huguenots, right, today? Carolina, they found us drifting in the sea along the coast, the rations almost gone, the three of us half crazy from the wind and sun, the boat a little leaky but afloat. From Saint-Domingue, the currents had been strong, the weather fair. We had been carried up past Charleston, we were told. I don't recall the journey well, you know. At five, bereft how much I did not realize then of both my parents. Sailing empty seas with Lou, our old negress, and Georges, my brother. She had learned, it was the years of those revolts of Haitians under Toussaint Louverture, that all the servants and the slaves herself included, were to rise against the French that week and slaughter everyone. She would not do it to us, children she had nursed and loved, and yet she could not speak against her people. She had thought to take us out, a boating party, so she said. She'd heard of islands thick with traveler's palm where birds refresh, refreshed themselves in flight. We left the sails like angels' wings. She'd managed to purloin a few supplies, fresh water most of all, some food, some sheets. We lived on coconuts, I think, and sugar toward the last. She may have had some rum. She sang to us at night her Creole lullabies. When we were saved, she told our story in her broken French. The strange thing is it was some French who found us, Huguenots. And stranger still, my name is Caroline. As if somehow by providence my mother had foreseen our odyssey. Now Lou, good woman, lies in Carolina ground. We had, of course, no photographs. My parents' smiles became a phosphorescent sea, 
translucent, dark, untouchable, a ghostly imago receding in the waves. Yet now they seem like children, younger than my own. They walk beneath the palm trees in my dreams and laugh, the trade wind scattering perfume, or sit at sunset, holding hands, and speak of France and golden journeys. Look, the tide is high. Sargasso shines in jeweled light. At dusk, I listen to the birds that wheel and dive and watch the stars grow powdery and dense and sometimes think I hear a song, a shout, two shadows calling on a distant shore. Thank you. That's it.